does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him but if anyone obeys his word god's love is truly made complete in him this is how we know we are in him whoever claims to live in him must walk as truth is good. well good morning church and as we prepare our hearts to in our in our minds and in our bodies to receive the lord's supper this morning i want you to be thinking about philippians chapter 4 verses 6 and 7, where Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So in this time in which we take the bread and the cup, let's pray a prayer of thanksgiving. We can let our needs and, and concerns be made known to him, but then remember when we take the bread and we take the cup, remember that we can have peace with God because he's with us in every moment of every one of our days. So take the bread, take the cup, put Jesus inside of you, inside your heart and your mind, knowing he is with you this day and every day. Let's pray and then let's receive the Lord's Supper together. Father, we're grateful that even though we're scattered about, that you have sent us your son. And as we take up these emblems, the bread and the cup, we're reminded that we carry Jesus with us in every moment of every one of our days. Father, give us the peace to know and the power to live with that certainty. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Uh, welcome to our home. This was supposed to be my first attempt to preach uh, in front of uh, a group of people at the church, but obviously we've had to make some adjustments. Um, I'm accustomed to sitting in my rocking chair in my living room talking to people, leading a small group, so I guess my foray into preaching will be me standing in my home talking to myself, which is a little bit weird. <clears throat> Okay, some of you might be asking, who is this guy? He doesn't look like the photo of the pastor on the website. Too much hair on his head, too little on his chin. I get it. My name is Gail Cotchell, and my family and I started attending Santa Clara Church about 20 years ago. So we consider this our family, and we are blessed to be a part of it. For those of you who have tuned in expecting to hear Wes, uh, sorry if you're feeling some disappointment. Uh, he's out of town um, on vacation, which he most certainly deserves. Uh, I've been privileged to hear him teach for several years, and I've come to truly love and respect him. And uh, He's out of the state, so I can say that out loud without embarrassing either one of us. Um, hopefully, at the end of the study, you won't question his judgment because he was the one who asked me to fill in for him while he was gone. I guess you just have to, or I guess you can just shut me off and if you are so inclined, since this is not in person, and so there's no awkward walk to the exit in the middle of it. Um, Lord willing, Wes will be back soon and we can resume studying in the book of Acts. However, today I wanted to step away from Acts and share my thoughts uh, about a few verses in the book of Micah. These verses will be familiar to many of you, um, and this passage is one of my favorites because it's made up of some of the most instructive yet simple um, words in the entire Bible. Uh, don't misunderstand my me, uh, excuse me. Don't misunderstand my use of the word simple. When I say simple, in this case, I mean short, succinct, and to the point, not easy or obvious. Like most directives given to us by God, uh, the simple instruction require us to look deeper, to, find, to figure out the how in the what. Let's move on and I'll try to show you what I mean. <clears throat> Let's go to Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Micah says, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Okay, let's pause for a minute there. I imagine if Micah was actually speaking to people and not just uh, writing this down or dictating it, he would stop here and look at his audience and maybe wait to give them a chance to ponder those questions. Uh, and perhaps somebody would offer a timid response. Well, Micah, we do offer sacrifices to, us, uh, to atone for our sins, don't we? Is this a trick question? Uh, we, know that we know what follows. So we can say the questions are rhetorical in nature. You know, the listener is expected to already know the answer. To the Israelites in Micah's era, the answer would not have been so obvious because the law was very specific about sacrifices and such. He is asking them, do you really believe that all God wants from you is sacrifices? Micah answered the question this way. He has told you, O oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Justice, kindness, humility. Three words that define our Lord's character. These are also three words that make up the definition of what it means to be a Christian. When Micah wrote, and what does the Lord require of you but to, he is saying everything the Lord wants of you can be found in those three things. Let's break it down, and I'll try uh, my best to 
to make this make sense. One, do justice. What is justice? It is definitely a word we frequently hear in the news and other media. Uh, we recite the Pledge of Allegiance and say at the end, liberty and justice for all. Mm -hmm. We have Lady Justice blindfolded, holding up a balanced scale in one hand and a sword in the other. We have a superhero fighting for truth, justice, and the American way. And then we have no justice, no peace. When we hear about justice, almost every time it is being used in a conversation about the law or the criminal justice system, right? Enforcement of the law should, without question, be done justly. No argument there. The world's definition of justice, however, when it comes to the legal system, is too often influenced by bias and personal prejudice. It can be twisted into a subjective view of how fairness is defined, but subjectivity has no place in justice. If rules are enforced consistently and punishment or reward is meted out equilaterally, justice is served. Justice does not concern itself with what the actual consequences or rewards are. Justice is dependent on the consequences or rewards being applied the same for everyone, every time, with fairness, impartiality, and consistency. But I don't think Micah was limiting God's command to do justice to those things related to the law. Michael was speaking of God's desire for all of his people, the entire nation. His, he was instructing everyone to do justice in their daily lives and the interaction with others. He was telling them to do justice in every aspect of life, not just in a courtroom. Remember what Paul wrote to the Galatian church. For you were all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. Neither male nor female. For you are all one in Jesus Christ. That's in chapter 3, verses 26 through 28. I think it's significant to note, in the literal sense, there were still Jews and Greeks, and there were still slaves and free men. There were still males and females. The thing is, they were all God's children. They were all Christians. They all had equal value in his eyes. There was still diversity in our parents, our ancestry, our circumstances, obviously. God knows our differences. He is very aware. He created us intentionally. He takes joy in our differences and loves us all the same. God's justice is perfect because God is consistent. Again, he loves us all the same. So how are we to do justice or act justly? The second greatest commandment according to Jesus and the Old Testament was what? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What does it take? It takes courage, conviction, and the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. Jesus told a story about a certain man who was waylaid by certain narrative wells on his way to Jericho. The miscreants beat him and went off, leaving him half dead. So, as the man, as the man is lying half dead in the ditch, a priest saw him, promptly crossed the road, and continued on his way without checking on the poor man. A Levite did the same thing. These were two, neither one of them even bothered to make an anonymous 911 call. These were two prominent men of Israel who knew the law, as did the lawyer who asked Jesus the question that prompted the story in the first place. Their definition of neighbor was very narrow. The man who looks like me believes what I believe, agrees with me, 
he is my neighbor. Not so fast. Another guy was traveling on the road that day, a Samaritan. We know Jews and Samaritans did not like each other. However, the Samaritan did not hesitate when he saw the bloodied man in the ditch. He felt compassion. He did not take time to identify the man as friend or foe. He did not stand and argue with himself about whether he should help the man or just ignore him. He did not ask himself if their circumstances were reversed, would this Jew help him? No, he felt com compassion and immediately administered first aid. Not just that, he took him to Jericho and cared for him. He did just not he didn't just roll up and drop him off in front of the emergency room. He paid for a room and gave the innkeeper money to cover the costs. Now this is obviously a story about showing mercy, but most importantly about treating all people with the same level of compassion. The Samaritan did just that because he was a compassionate person. He was a courageous person who sincerely believed in doing the right thing. He was a just person. He did not let any political, ethnic, or racial bias prevent him from doing the right thing. He saw a person in need and helped him. That is the kind of compassion we are supposed to have too. That is what act justly means. God's justice is demonstrated in his grace. The consequences of sin are consistent. The opportunity for grace is too. In Romans 3, 21 through 23, Paul told the church, <clears throat> But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And later, in Romans 10, verses 12 and 13, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. A key component of justice is, you guessed it, kindness. So our point number two is we're to love kindness. The author Henry James is credited with saying, <clears throat> three things in life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third, you guessed it, is to be kind. A Roman philosopher named Lucius Aeneas Seneca departed this wisdom on us in part of this wisdom. Whoever, excuse me, wherever there is a human being, there is an opportunity for a kindness. Ezra Taft Benson wrote, one who is kind is sympathetic and gentle with others. He is considerate of others' feelings and courteous in his behavior. He has a helpful nature. Kindness pardons others' weaknesses and faults. Kindness is extended to all to the aged and the young, to animals, to those of low station as well as the high. The New Testament is full of examples and instructions about kindness. Kindness is not just suggested, it is pretty much required. So what does it mean to be kind? In Acts chapter 9, verse 36, we are told about a special woman in Joppa named Tabitha. Luke identifies her as a disciple and describes her this way. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. Now to paraphrase the rest of the story, Tabitha dies and is mourned by those who, who were recipients of her kindness. Peter is summoned and he raises her from the dead. She was a kind person who was loved in her community for her kindness. That's an example. In 1 Corinthians, 13.4, Paul wrote, love is patient, love is kind. Kindness is a key component of love. Paul also, also wrote letters to the churches in Ephesus, Galatia, and Colossae. 
He told the Ephesians to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. In his, loose, in his list of the fruit of the Spirit to the Galatians, he includes kindness. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. He wrote to the Colossians. And so, as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Peter added his two cents in his second letter. He says, now for this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Okay, so I think you get the idea. These are just a few examples of how kindness is emphasized in the teaching of the apostles and how important it is to be a kind person. Note that. We are not instructed to just do kind things, but to be a kind person. Kindness must be a part of our character. There is a difference. We are told to not only do, such, do kind things or act in a way, in a kind way, but to love kindness to see kindness as a, as a necessary virtue, not an avenue to get recognition or ease our consciences. So I ask myself again, what is kindness? It is inclusive of so many things. Genuine love, sincere compassion, heartfelt gentleness, empathy, sympathy, mercy. One thing is certain, you know it when you experience it. Now let's go back and look at Jesus' story about the Samaritan. When he helped the injured man, Jesus did not in any way indicate the Samaritan was expecting anything in return. He even agreed to start a tab for the man, which he promised to repay when he passed back through town. The Samaritan was a kind man, not just a man who did a kind thing. We should love kindness to the point that it is such a strong part of our character that we practice it without really thinking about to whom we are showing kindness. So as we live in our lives doing justice and loving kindness, there is one more thing Micah has to say about what God requires of us. The third thing is walk humbly with your God. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. That is found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Take notice where Peter says, humble yourselves. To truly be a humble person, one has to humble oneself. Jesus gave the greatest examples of humbling oneself when he washed the disciples' feet. When Jesus finished, he told them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, neither is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now, Paul was not present at the Last Supper, but he obviously got it. He instructed the Philippian church to do nothing about, to do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. That is, of course, what Jesus did. Paul continues, have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Our example is always Jesus. One of the first events we read about in Matthew's Gospel is the account of Jesus' temptation by Satan. Satan tried to bait Jesus by playing to his pride. If you are the Son of God, turn these breads into stone. Prove you are the Son of God and make God protect you from harming yourself. Submit to me and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. If you are the Son of God, act like it. Interesting to note, pride is what got Satan tossed out of heaven. Of course, Jesus knew who he was and he demonstrated humility at the greatest highest level. He demonstrated the same humility throughout his entire time on earth. Humbling ourselves again requires us to look inside our hearts and make an intentional change in our attitudes. That being said, there is another less desirable way to be humble. We usually refer to it as being humiliated. One source defines it this way. Humiliation is the abasement of pride, which creates mortification or leads to a state of being humbled or reduced to lowliness or submission. It is an emotion felt by a person whose social status, either by force or willingly, has just decreased. Now we can choose to humble ourselves before God, or we can wait to be humbled. Let's stick with Paul. A little further in Philippians, he wrote, Therefore, God also exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now we have chosen to bow down before God and confess Jesus as our Lord before that day not out of fear, but out of love. In the end, everyone will be humbled before God. Okay, so what is humility? Humility is putting others above oneself. We just read that, right? It is getting, giving credit where credit is due. It is thankfulness for what we have and acknowledging where it all came from. It is reverence and willing submission to God. The world's view of humility does not always line up with the Christian view. Humbling oneself isn't usually something celebrated or encouraged. Humiliating others seems to be a more desirable activity. Demonstrating superiority over others and gloating in one's own strength and accomplishments are the norm. We know better. Humility is not weakness. It takes courage and confidence to humble oneself. It is not timidity. The same Paul who defined humility for us also wrote to Timothy and encouraged him, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. It is not a lack of confidence. Hebrews 10.39 assures us, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and are saved. It's not being quiet or passive when it comes to our faith. At the end of Acts, we hear Paul boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. Humility is not constantly groveling before God. By his grace, he has lifted us up, and we can walk with him as his children. We can approach him with confidence. Confidence is not arrogance. Don't confuse the two. Most of the time, arrogance is a result of insecurity. We believe in the Word of God and are confident it is the ultimate truth. We believe Jesus is the only way to be saved from sin. We know in our hearts we are right. The result of our confidence is joy and a desire for everyone else to know and accept the truth. We are not to belittle or ridicule anyone who has not yet accepted it. It is our responsibility to present it with gentleness and without condemnation and to allow the Holy Spirit to do His work. Now we can't leave our discussion about humility without returning to our old friend, the Samaritan. 
We have established, or more accurately, I've told you, I believe the Samaritan was a just, kind man. I believe Jesus was also telling us the Samaritan was a humble man. Jesus had many encounters with Samaritans during his life on earth. One time, when he was traveling with his disciples, he stopped at a well where he encountered a Samaritan woman. I'm not going to relate the story. You can refresh your memories later by reading it in John chapter 4. The point is, I want to bring up, it's found in the ninth chapter, or excuse me, the ninth verse of the fourth chapter. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. When John added his side note about Jews not having deal, <coughs> excuse me, dealings with Samaritans, it is understated in his narrative, but it is a very significant detail. <clears throat> the relationship between Jews and Samaritans is obvious. Not good. We will leave it at that and can continue on with the other story. The Samaritan on the road to Jericho had lived a life in which he was treated as less than human by Jews. He could have carried resentment and probably harbored a lot of anger and distrust toward Jews in general. He could have allowed his pride to overcome his humanity and just passed on by the man, but he did not do that. He recognized a person in dire need of help and went the extra mile to do the right thing. He was a humble man. There's no way to legislate these three things into being genuine. There are no external mechanisms to enforce them. Laws and social, social mores can make us act the part of the just, kind, and humble citizen. The government can create statutes and ordinances that will impose penalties on us if we don't comply, but there are still people out there who choose to be biased racist and discriminatory. There will still be people who choose to be mean-spirited and unkind. There will still be people who make excuses for their arrogance and view it as a strength. The changes we might be required to make have to be sincere changes in our hearts, not just conforming our outward appearances. So, the Good Samaritan of our Sunday School stories is actually much more. He should forevermore be referred to as the just, kind, and humble Samaritan. That's my opinion, anyway. As an interesting side note, if you don't mind listening for a few more minutes, when I first started studying and preparing for this lesson, I had not intended to reference the just, kind, and humble Samaritan at all. As I studied and cross-referenced and read commentaries, I compared the question addressed by Micah, what does the Lord require of you but to, with the question asked of Jesus, teacher, what shall I do to inherit inter eternal life? Both questions really have the same answer. Micah's response of do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God it's another way of saying what the lawyer responded when Jesus asked him what the law said he must do. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Both responses tell us the necessity for God's people to love God and love others. Simple, right? Micah reminded Israel what God required of them. Jesus came and not only taught the same things, he showed us how to do it. Let's go back and take another look at the verses Teresa read earlier. The man who says, I know him, and does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Now, how did Jesus walk? Read the Gospels and really get to know him. The rest of the New Testament is there to teach us, to convict us, to correct us, and train us in righteousness. That's found in 2 Timothy 3.16. The life of Jesus is there to show us. Micah answered the question, what does God require? 
This comment is paraphrased from Barnes Notes on Micah 6, 6 through 8. The very word implies an earnest inward search of ourselves. God would say to us, do not bother presenting any of these things, burnt offerings, rams, calves, without offering yourself. He does not want what is yours. He wants you. Not just your physical body, but your spirit. Not ram or goat, but your heart. You ask God, what do you want from me? He says, I want you. What more does God truly want from you but you? Of all creation, God has not made anything more valuable than you. He wants you to freely give yourself because alone you are lost. God does, does not want us to only do just things and do kind things or do things that give the impression of humility. He wants us to be just, kind, humble people. He wants us to love him with everything we are. He wants us to look at everybody through his eyes. But sometimes, if we want to change who we are, we have to start with changing what we do. What is a sermon without an insight from C.S. Lewis? <clears throat> In Mere Christianity, he wrote, Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. The worldly man treats certain people kindly because he likes them. The Christian, trying to treat everyone kindly, finds himself liking more and more people as he goes on, including people he could not even have imagined himself liking at the beginning. Some writers use the word charity to describe not only the Christian love between human beings, but also God's love for man and man's love for God. About the second of these two, people are often worried. They are told they ought to love God. They cannot find any such feelings in themselves. But what are they to do? The answer is the same as before. Act as if you did. Do not sit trying to manufacture feelings. Ask yourself, if I were sure I loved God, what would I do? When you have found the answer, go and do it. Lewis also believed the opposite was true. Paraphrasing what he said, he said, if you spend your time doing hurtful, evil things to other people, you will find yourself hating them and wanting to do them even more harm. History backs that theory up pretty clearly. Just some things to ponder if you're struggling with how to initiate a change in yourself. So, in a nutshell, I guess I just took whatever, how long it took me to tell you, be a good person. Or even more to the point, be nice. I told you it was simple. The thing is, as we mature into adults, we tend to lose perspective on the simple, easy to understand things in life. We want to complicate things and add conditions. We want to give reasons, make excuses, most of the time assigning blame to everyone but ourselves. I believe I could tell a child, be nice, and that child would know exactly what I was tell telling them to do and not to do. On the other hand, I could suggest to some adults that they could stand to be a little nicer, and they would be offended and tell me to stop treating them like a child. Being nice is not really that hard. Really. What inside of us is preventing us from being nice people? Being Christ-like is deliberately easy. Being Christ-like does not mean creating the world, performing miracles, and everything else that goes with being with God. It means treating people like Jesus treated people, and loving people like Jesus loved people. It is a choice we make and it is a virtue we demand of everyone else. Would all the world's problems be solved if everyone was nice to everyone else? Maybe. We can't control anyone else's attitudes, but we can certainly control our own. I think the world's problems would be solved
if everyone followed the instructions given to us by Micah and the example shown to us by Jesus. At the end of Jesus' story, he asked the lawyer, who of these three travelers proved to be a neighbor to the injured man? When the lawyer answered, the one who showed mercy. Jesus' instructions were simple and to the point. He told the lawyer and everyone else who heard the story, go and do the same. Thanks for listening to me this morning or this afternoon, whenever you're listening. And uh, we look forward to Wes coming back soon. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels, guide upon you with his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Neath his wings securely hide you. Till